you hear again the theme that we've had for our Advent journey this year, this theme of, of welcome. Welcome to our world, welcome to our time, welcome to our homes, welcome in our lives. Welcome, Holy Son of God. How are we doing? Are we really doing that? I'm going to back you up because this is the last Sunday before we, we kick into Christmas time. And, and then you're all going to be filled with such joy and, and happiness that, that you're not going to really listen because you're so excited, right? Remember back Thanksgiving? That, that's been what? Wow, that's way back when. That's a month ago, right? I challenged myself, but I asked all of you to take on the same challenge. Before you say anything negative, remember those ten lepers? Think of ten positive things that are going on. How we doing? He wasn't talking to me. Right? Oh, man. Well, I, I want to start there because I think what so oftentimes happens with, with this time of year and this, this joyous season that we're in and, and this wonderful illustration God gave us that though your sins be like scarlet, they will be as white as... Anybody remember? Snow. Yeah. This perfect Christmas that God is giving us. Are we going to allow it to be perfect? Or are we going to make it imperfect? Our, our first lesson for today, God is talking through Isaiah to uh, this guy by the name of Ahaz. Anybody here ever know an Ahaz? Maybe not by that name, but, but Ahaz was one of these guys that, that had the wonderful ability to find something wrong with everything. Ever met him? So, as Isaiah is talking to him, Isaiah says, Ahaz, how you doing? And Ahaz gave this comment, I will not put the Lord to the test. Ahaz was spoken to very nicely by Isaiah after that. And he said, get real, dude. That's my translation. You have been putting God to the test over and over and over again with your negativity, with the way you've been living your life. Instead of celebrating the goodness of God, you've made everything imperfect. Instead of seeing the perfection of God. Well, out of that comes a statement that volumes have been written about. Isaiah gives him a prophecy and he says, get ready for the right signs now instead of all the wrong ones. And he's talking about the promised gift of Jesus and he says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And out of that, he will know enough to reject the wrong. Reject the wrong? Hmm. Jesus will know enough to reject the wrong. You know, that just caught me wrong this week. So I did a, a, a deeper look into this. And, and it really doesn't talk about reject. But rather, it gives a, a connotation of something that I, I pray we have during this year. It's not a matter of rejecting the wrong. It's a matter of knowing it so blatantly, so clearly, that when something comes our way that we know is wrong, it's not a matter of rejecting it. It's a matter of just going, no way, Jose, or however you want to say it. Having that attitude that begins to change that when something wrong is happening, what do you do about it? I don't need to reject it. I just don't do it. Well, he added to that. He says, he will know enough to choose the right. We've got a problem in our world today that's not a new problem. We think we have a lot of choices. Or at least we create choices that really aren't choices. That when we allow the Word of God to speak in our lives and, and be lived out and we put on Christ, something begins to happen. No, it doesn't just begin to happen. It changes us. 
Now, I want to give you some examples of some stuff that's come my way this week uh, through some reading that I did that, that reminded me of how often we miss what God wants to do because of our attitudes. You ready? The wireless music box has no imaginable commercial value. David Sarnoff and Associates in the 1920s. Now, we might not call it the wireless music box today. It was later called a radio. Now it's called an iPod or the Sirius XM. Aren't you glad that it has no commercial value today? Their point was, nobody would want to listen to something that they don't know where it's coming from. Now, I'm, I'm just looking at your faces. How many of you had ever heard of David Sarnoff before? <clears throat> Wonder why. The supercomputer is technologically impossible. New York University, a prestigious university. So that way back when... I'm not even going to give you the year on that one. Anybody here got a smartphone? Yeah. Realize that a smartphone today has more computing capabilities than a supercomputer that they ever dreamed of in that day? No technological use? Right. I don't know what use anyone could find for a machine that would make copies. Tom Watson was the president of IBM at that time. The inventor of this thing that made copies said, I disagree. He started a new company. Its name on the screen, Xerox. What happens when we think small? What happens when we look at our world and go, uh-uh, ain't going to happen? See what we lose? There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Look the year. 1977. You think he was wrong? And yet again, there is Digital Equipment Corporation. Not around anymore. What's the point? The point is, as God speaks to our world, we begin to see things through different eyes and begin to understand things totally, totally different. Charles Schultz has been with our Lord for a number of years, yet whenever you see a picture of that tree, what do you think of? Not just Charlie Brown, but not just a Charlie Brown Christmas, but you know what they did with it? Charlie Brown brings out this tree and it looks like that and everybody goes, oh, Charlie Brown. But when they joined together and their attitude changed, they bonded together as a team and what did God do through them? Wow. What happened to the ugly Christmas tree? Yeah. I don't even need to put it up, you know. Because the image there. Well, let's fast forward to our gospel lesson for today, to that imperfect Christmas that was going on, that first one, remember? There, there's some awesome things that are said in that, and, and what I challenge you to do today, with all the extra time you're going to have, because you're not shoveling snow or anything, uh, when you go home, pull out your Bible Read the Christmas story as though you've read it for the very first time and see what words pop out at you. I did that, and, and while I was reading our gospel for today, this popped out at me. Literally, when Joseph woke up, ever been living a nightmare? Ever been in that zone in your life where you were just going through the motions? trying to figure stuff out and go, man, what are we going to do next? It's kind of like having a new baby. Man, what do we do now? Then Joseph woke up. And it was like, huh. wow. 
And you know what that gospel reading does? Joseph woke up and he realized, Emmanuel, God is with us. So all that other stuff, all that, all that stuff that's imperfect, God's with us. That makes it perfect. <sighs> then something's lost. Then Joseph did what he was commanded. And I go, man. This is my moment for husbands and wives, so if you're sitting next to your, your, your beloved spouse that, that many years ago you said, uh, do you, and you said yes, and you said do you, and you said yes. So ever since that wedding day, you've done what you've been commanded. Right? Right? <laughs> See how the word is blown away? That's not what it means. Joseph did what he had the opportunity to do to be part of the fulfillment of all God's promises, all that God had imagined for him and Mary and their son. Here, a little bit different than he did what he was commanded. Well, let me give you a picture of the perfect Christmas. We've got um, the shepherd back there. We've got the, the donkey. We've got the sheep. All, all we need is the little drummer boy, and it's going to be perfect, right? It was perfect because Emmanuel, God, is with us. And so all the other stuff, all the glitz, the glamour, all the presents, there's no Christmas tree. How can it be Christmas? <coughs> Emmanuel. <sighs> Joseph did what was arranged by God. And you know, since God is with each and every one of us, he's got something arranged too. To make it a wonderful Christmas if we let it be and see it through maybe some different eyes. One of the blessings I have as a pastor and having an angel tree like we have in the other room is to occasionally take some things and, and let people see Christmas as something besides just chaos. And, and so I was blessed to take uh, some of the gifts to a family this last week. And that family has an 18-month-old boy now, I'm going to let your minds wonder for a little bit. What's an 18-year-old boy like? <laughs> it's fun. Had a box full of gifts, and I sat down on the couch, and I, I was taking communion to the family, too, so I had my little communion set, and the 18-month-old came and sat on my lap. And I said, that gift right there is for you. So what does an 18-month-old do when they know a gift is for them? <laughs> Boy, your imaginations took a long time to get there. <laughs> Started to reach for it. I said, ah, you got to have to wait till your mommy says it's okay. <laughs> so he looked at my communion set, which is a wooden box. He grabbed it, put it in his package. And I said, do you think that's for you too? He looked at me and gave me an 18-month-old look. And as loud and as clear as he could have possibly said it, he said, Duh! <laughs> Looked at his mom. Did you teach him that? <laughs> no. Where's that come from? You hear the message that we present and the package that is there, that of the imperfect Christmas that we go into and we go, there's the chaos. No. What a beautiful moment. Because that gift was for him too. It began in his baptismal grace. And one day by the glory and the care of his parents, one day that gift will be his in the sacrament of our Lord's Supper. But in the meantime, 
Where's God? Emmanuel, God with us. There's a picture of the perfect Christmas. It's taken last Wednesday. Now it's your turn. What are you going to do with Christmas this year? Will it be perfect? His name is Jesus. Please rise.